The Cavalcade of America. At Thanksgiving time, when our nation and our people reflect on the many things for which we should be thankful, we cannot fail to include thanks for the American spirit of self-reliance, which is so well illustrated by tonight's episode in the Cavalcade of America, presented by DuPont, one of America's oldest industries. And this same self-reliance that Americans have shown in generations past is duplicated today in chemical research laboratories, like those of DuPont, where patient scientists work constantly to create better things for better living through chemistry. The action of this evening's first episode takes place at sea in the year 1620 on board the Mayflower as it neared the end of its historic voyage to the New World. Our cavalcade orchestra sets the stage with excerpts from the overture to Wagner's opera, The Flying Dutchman, in which the composer portrayed the stormy voyage of his legendary hero. days of our country, America and her communities 
have been solving their own problems without asking for outside aid. Let us go back to the year 1620. For 65 days, the good ship Mayflower has been buffeted by seas and winds. On board are 102 brave souls seeking a home in the new world. They have planned to land somewhere along the Delaware River, but waves and weather have carried them far off their course. When on November 9th, the pilgrims finally sight land, it proves to be not the shore they are seeking, but the rock-bound coast of New England. So southward, the Mayflower turns, but only for a short time. Let's go, you poor cop! Here's your helm. Captain Jones. Captain Jones, what is the meaning of this? We're putting back, Master Carver. Putting, putting back, back to England? Hardly, sir. Back. To the land we just sighted, Cape Cod. What well, our land lies to the south of us. And so do shoals and reefs, Master Brewster. Surely we can skirt about them. I'm taking no chances. I've managed to bring this ship 3,000 miles, and I'm not seeing her go to the bottom within sight of land. Oh, the captain is right. Listen to those breakers. We're putting into the first harbor we find. And there are your landing. Well spoken, Captain. Don't say I. Let's have done with argument and land. We have no authority to land in New England. Our patent is from the Virginia Company. Patents be hanged. We want to get ashore. But don't you understand? The Virginia Company has no jurisdiction as far north as this. So much the better, Master Brewster. We can do as we please. <laughs> what say you, Master Carver? It has been a long journey. Our food supplies are low. I, I like not landing without authority. But it does seem the only thing to do. Well, who wants authority? Not I. We had our case of that in England. Freedom, that's what we're after. Liberty. Every man his own master. His master ashore, maybe. But not while you're aboard this ship. I'm the master here, and I'm giving orders to put back to Cape Cod. Now, stand by to go about. That same day, as the Mayflower slowly beat her way up around Cape Cod, the leaders of the pilgrims gathered in the cabin in sober conclave. Master Carver, I'm worried about some of our company. Did you hear their boastings this morning? How they said they would take advantage of their liberty once we landed? Aye. An unruly lot, these London men. Cut from a different pattern from our Leiden folk. Aye. Give them a free hand and there'll be naught but trouble in the settlement. Had we only been able to secure a charter from the king, giving us the right to govern ourselves. In a crisis like this, my friend, there's nothing to do but to take matters into our own hands. Uh, my army numbers only a dozen men, sirs, but we stand ready to enforce order. Thank you, Captain Standish. If military measures become necessary, we will call upon you. But was not that I had in mind. A civil government is what we must create. You are right, Master Carver. Let us straightway appoint some of our own number here as a governing body. What governors our little colony has must be chosen by common consent. But our boasting friends on deck will never consent to any rule. Then they will not be permitted to land. We will draw up a covenant, which every man must sign tomorrow, before he leaves this ship, agreeing to abide by the common will. In this way only can we be sure of law and order. Just before the Mayflower dropped anchor in the lee of Cape Cod, an order went forth for all her passengers to assemble in the cabin. The tiny stifling room was packed to overflowing as John Carver rose and addressed them. My friend, we find ourselves for the first time in our lives subject to no law, nobody to rely upon but ourselves. It is a strange situation for folk who have lived always under an established order. For this reason, we have drawn up a covenant. I will read it to you. Having undertaken for the glory of God and advancement of the Christian faith and honor of our king and country, a voyage to plant the first colonies in the northern part of Virginia, we do by these present solemnly and mutually in the presence of God and of one of another, covenant and combine ourselves together into a civil body politic for our labor, ordering, and preservation, unto which we promise all due submission and obedience. 
in which this word off we appear under subscribed our names at Cape Cod, the 11th day of November, in the year of the reign of our sovereign lord, King James of England, Arno Domini, 1620. Forty-one men we number in our company. Forty-one signatures, then, are required. What about women? Aye, they're the troublemakers. <laughs> they should be made to sign. Yeah. <laughs> you know full well that females put not their names to documents. The time is short, my friend. Captain Jones is preparing to anchor. If you will step forward one by one and sign your names, over here on this table I have ready ink and quill. If you will please step this way. I'll Master put my name to no such paper. No, I. Laws, constitutions. <laughs> We're well rid of them. Uh, We're not surprised. I hear you refuse to sign. I, if you heard us. Then you remain aboard the Mayflower. Huh? No man in this company will be allowed to set foot ashore until he has subscribed to this covenant. You think you'll keep us from landing after coming all this way? I am sure of it. Unless you sign. <laughs> We thought this was a free country we were coming to, where a man could do as he pleased. No man, my friend, can be a law unto himself. Authority, there must be. In England, maybe. In any place where men would live and work together. Make your choice. Sign or remain aboard. It's an outrage. It is for your own protection. <laughs> Come, let's go on deck and view this new world. You who have not yet signed the covenant, stay. What is your decision? Must it be made now? If you wish to land. I'm signing. Good. And you, sir? No. If there must be laws here, at least we'll have a voice in making them. Where's the quail? Here. And you, sir? Uh, I subscribe... The Mayflower Covenant is complete. Thus, even before they set foot on soil of America, our forebearers displayed the spirit of self-reliance and as a community successfully faced the problems that confronted them without seeking outside aid. And these same brave pioneers, when they established the day of Thanksgiving that we observe tomorrow, left us the priceless heritage of resolution and courage with which we face our own problems. Before we go on to this evening's second episode, our cavalcade orchestra will play one of Victor Herbert's loveliest melodies, Indian Summer.
the American cavalcade moves onward. The spirit of resourcefulness still lives in the hearts of our people. They face hardships today with the same courage that helped our forefathers snatch civilization from the wilderness. The years go by until we reach another November. It is in the Wenaski Valley in the state of Vermont, November 3rd, 1927. November the 4th to be exact, for the clock in the kitchen of the Sherburn farmhouse has already passed midnight. In the bedroom off the parlor, John and Jenny Sherburn are lying awake listening to the downpour outside. John, you awake? I ain't been asleep. Oh, me either. wonder what time it is. Half past twelve. Last time I got up to look. If we could only open up the window, Mike, so it wouldn't be so close in open here. Open up a window and we'd be soaked. Rain's coming from every which way. Yeah, I thought it'd let up by now. Uh, it's coming down hard, if anything. Just listen to that. Mm. It's getting colder, too. I hope to goodness this don't turn into snow. It'll be a blizzard if it does. Walloper. But at that, it's almost time for snow. It's only a few weeks till Thanksgiving. Yep. Oh, uh, we got a lot to be thankful for this year, too. Yeah, we ain't done so bad. You see, the farm's paid for itself for the first time since we bought it. And by next year, John, we ought to have some money laid aside. Yeah. I guess I'll get up and take a look outside. It's pitch dark, John. You couldn't see a thing. Oh, lay down and try to go to sleep. I can't sleep. That river making so much noise. Well, you've slept by that river all your life. Uh, I never heard a roar like this before, though. I wonder if the cows is all right. Oh, the barn's tight as a drum. Yes, but it's down low there in the holler. John, you don't think... Listen. It... Listen to that river, Jenny. She's rising fast. Well, she rises every year in the spring, and we never... Have... Way up over the high mark for spring. She was over that when we went to bed. I tell you, I'm uneasy about them cows. I don't know what to be bothering with them, because the springtime... Ca... Hmm? A telephone. Gracious, John. Who can be calling anybody at this time of night? Somebody's sick, most likely. Well, whose ring is it? Listen. It's a general party ring. Father, answer it quick. Yes, yes, I'm going. Oh, watch out in the dark there, Father. Yes. Hello? What? Hello? Yes? Yeah? From Barry. Yes? Who is it, John? What's happened? Then the Goshen. That bad, is it? John. All right. Thank you. I saw him up. John, what is it? Just what I was afraid of. Only worse. Tell me. Flood. <gasps> yep. The Winoski's on the rampage. Oh. Carrying away buildings, knocking down bridges, washing out roads. Oh. Montpelier and Barry's already bad hit. We'll get it for morning. They're sending word all the way down the line, warning folks. Oh, John. Get the lantern lit, Mother. Oh, yes. Well, I get some clothes on here. Well, what are you going to do? I'm going to get the cows out of the barn and drive them up the hill past you. Do you want me to come and help you? No, no, you stay here. There may be more messages. Central oh. said they'd keep us posted as long as they could. No telling when the wires will be down. Oh. Now, where's my boots? Here, here they are, Father. And, and here's the lantern. Thanks. <laughs> what do you suppose could have started a flood at this time of year? There's no snow. Result? Result of unprecedented precipitation. That's what the report said. Unprecedented? Unprecedented precipitation. Well, what in the world does that mean? It means that it's raining like all tarnation. For two days, the waters rise with unabated fury. Houses are carried away. Telephone and telegraph wires are down. Roads are swept away by the angry waters. The worst flood in the history of Vermont. The capital, Montpelier, is cut off from the rest of the state. In the city of Rutland, many miles away, the town clerk is receiving all communications. Ending any further reports, Jim? The entire town of Ludlow has been abandoned. Every last soul has moved out. The town's underwater. And the casualties? We don't know. Hardest thing in the world to get anything definite from any of those sections that are hard hit with wires down, power off and all. How'd you get this much? Just by luck. By radio. What? Some amateur operator down that way. Just happened to pick it up. Good work. Another batch of telegrams addressed to the governor. I'll take them. Mostly offers of help. Everything from airplanes to aspirin. Here's a telegram from Governor Smith in Albany, offering help from the state of New York. Food, clothing. Let me see it. 
Say, I'd like to get this to Governor Weeks himself for good. Montpelier's still cut off. Nothing getting through? Not a thing. They're trying foot messengers now. They may be able to make it. We can't wait to forward messages like this for foot. Well, how else will we... Radio. They can still pick up messages in Montpelier by radio. I'll wire Governor Smith and ask him to broadcast his telegram to Governor Weeks. Take this message to Governor Alfred E. Smith. Executive Mansion, Albany, New York. Still the flood rages. Still the city of Montpelier is cut off from the outside world. On November 6th, in the executive mansion, we find the governor of Vermont speaking to his secretary. Get word to Major Perkins in Rutland. Tell him to open the state armory for refugees. Yes, sir. Burlington is rushing food and blankets. Yes, sir. That's all. Uh, what about all these messages, sir? Messages? These offers of help from the outside. They're pouring in every hour. Oh, yes, I know. Amazing, the generosity of folks at a time like this. Well, they all want to know what they can do for us, what Vermont needs in the way of help. They're waiting for an answer, sir. I will tell them. I'll issue a statement to the whole country. Yes, sir. Have the following message radioed to all states, cities, organizations, and individuals who have offered help. Yes, sir. Please accept the thanks of the people of Vermont for all the generous offers of sympathy and assistance which have come to us. If we find the situation beyond our control, we shall be glad to call on outside help. Until then, Vermont will do as it has always done and take care of itself. The worst flood in the history of Vermont. 125 killed. Over 16,000 homeless. Total property damage estimated at $25 million. In the general store at Williston, in the Winoski Valley, a little group of Green Mountain folk stood talking a week later. Among them is John Sherburn. Morning. Well, it sure feels good to get in where it's halfway warm. Move up the stove. We got room, I tell it. Thanks. Glad to find some of you men together here. I'm a reporter from the New York Times. Yes, sir. I came up here to get a story. Story, huh? Yeah, about the flood. Oh, yes. Yeah. Kind of late, ain't it? Well, I don't mean regular news. It's a human interest story I'm after. Oh, yeah. You folks all live right around here, I suppose. Yes. You're here during all the trouble? Yes, we was. Well, I wish you'd tell me something about your experiences. Well, our experiences is like everybody else's, I guess. I'd like to be able to report how you're getting on. We're getting on fine. Now, well... Well, some of you have lost your homes, haven't you? Lots of us. We've lost our homes, lost our stuff, and our pasture lands and our buildings. But you can go back home, young man, and tell your paper that we certainly appreciate your interest, but nobody needs to worry about the folks of Vermont. We're still eating regular. November 24th, 1927. All through the devastated regions of Vermont, folks gather for Thanksgiving dinners provided by more fortunate communities. At John Sherburn's farmhouse, a group is assembled around the table. Friends, friends, before we set ourselves down to the turkey and fixings, I'd like to suggest that we pause for just a moment and give thanks to the Lord for, for our blessings. We got a lot to be thankful for, you know, in spite of what's happened. We've got fine medical care for those that's sick or injured. We've got up-to-date scientific knowledge to help us rebuild and get going again. We've got the assurance of financial backing, those of us that need it. The state of Vermont has worked out all that, and we've got friends all over the country wishing us well. Compared with our forefathers who observed that first Thanksgiving, I'd say that, that we was mighty well off. Now let's all join together in, in singing the dark All right, Jenny.
let us give thanks for that great American trait. The self-reliance of our communities, their ability to weather storms and to mount catastrophes, smiling, unflinching, today as in the pioneer hours of the cavalcade of America. Americans are quick to rebuild after disasters, it doesn't take a catastrophe to create the urge for improvement. Whether it's a matter of tearing down an old building and putting up a new and better one, or simply the improvement of machinery and materials, the chemist plays an important part in this rebuilding by creating new and better products. One example is found in the improvement in paints and enamels. For many years, DuPont chemists have devoted intensive research to the creation of better finishing materials. One example of their work is Duco, already familiar to most of you as the outstanding finish for use on automobiles and many articles used in the home. A later development is Dulux, also the result of scientific chemical research. In describing this revolutionary finish, one has to use a curious combination of examples because Dulux resembles more closely in feel and hardness the qualities of ivory than any other material, and yet at the same time it has an unusual flexibility. Dulux is used on many of the new streamlined trains and on some of our largest ocean liners. This product of chemical research also serves homes throughout America, for millions of refrigerators have been finished in Dulux. When you see how chemical research improves articles used daily, indoors and out, you can readily understand the full meaning of DuPont's phrase, better things for better living, through chemistry. Next Wednesday at this same time, DuPont will again present the Cavalcade of America. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. WABC, New York.